Do you all see the PowerPoint? Yes, doctor, it's visible. Visible, all right. And my voice is clear, right? Uh, is it too too loud or too uh, it's okay? Loud and clear, doctor. Loud and clear, all right. So I'm going to go very fast because I have, this is sort, sort of a, the third case study. Uh, it's more like a show and tell thing. What I'm going to do here, talk about a country I entered for the first time in 27 years ago. So this case study has three faces. First part is I want to mention my connection with that country uh, in uh, 94, 95. Uh, then I came to Canada and then 2007, I got an invitation to do a major consulting assignment for the government of Guyana. So I want to talk about that. That happened 12 years after I left this country, Guyana. And then I want to give you another snapshot of what has happened now, 12 years after that, in uh, 2019, and now, current, uh, how the country is doing. So I think it's a very interesting case study. Uh, I want to uh, we will quickly uh, talk about it. So uh, the three case studies, you already mentioned the challenges, the big boy problems in Sri Lanka, uh, hosting a head of state, Jamaica, but we try to relate it to Sri Lanka. Then the case study. Uh, before that, I'll give a couple of comments about the two case studies that you already discussed. All right, so we have three, uh, we know these three sections. Uh, uh, by the way, the question of the day, uh, I see that about 11 people have answered. Uh, percent of you said yes, it is you can use uh, all uh, best practices. Uh, 12% uh, said, or three people out of 11 said no. So that's okay. Excuse that's me, okay. Sir, doctor, yeah. uh, because I got the question as, uh, can you learn from all best practices? That's why I said uh, no. Yeah, but we are discussing three old best, best practices today. That's what we are doing. One from the 1979, one from 1997 or 98, and one from 2007. They're all old, right? So okay. that's my question. Can you learn something from? It's okay. Whatever you said it doesn't matter. But just to get a feel of, you know, what you. Uh, all right. All right. Don't, okay. don't worry about. Okay. All right. So I just want to give the feedback. Eighty-eight percent said yes. So that is good. My answer is yes because uh, that's why I said leak on you. He said if you can't understand, learn from the history. You can't build a bright future like what has happened in Singapore. So that was the that was the sort of a. A rationale for this question. Anyway, don't worry. Uh, so, quick uh, 10 lessons that uh, from the Hotel Sony case study. Uh, if I look at it, I read it again. I, I see 10 things that you can carry forward and use in your careers. Uh, so, one is the professional handover. When you are leaving one hotel, in this particular case, I was transferred from one John Keys hotel to another one. So, it's the same. Uh, uh, thing, but sometimes you change the company. But it's very important you don't burn the bridges behind you. So you make a most professional handover to your successor in the earlier job. Uh, there also I mentioned something about must know training. Often hoteliers, particularly professors, and we try to teach people everything. Nice to know things, should know things. I say don't do that. I say if you are doing a quick training, Focus on the must-know stuff, all right? Uh, I used to, uh, my food and beverage professors in uh, Toronto used to teach them uh, how to open the uh, champagne, a bottle of champagne with a spoon. So I said, that's good. It's a nice to know things. The day-to-day -day operation, you're not going to do that, right? Because that's the style. You open with a sword, you break the, the champagne and then serve it, you know? So I said, you know, uh, let's focus on must-know stuff when you're doing hotel training. Pre-job research is very important. Most hoteliers don't do that. They assume they just show up to the new job. You have to do, for you to be successful, do research. That's what you are doing as a graduate uh, students. Apply that in your job. Do the research about the environment. All those things you learned uh, under marketing, you know, the, the pest factors and the, the, the sort analysis, all those things you do very quickly. You don't have to put it in those brackets exactly. 
seeking advice is very important my advice was from the other managers in the area because i want to understand the culture why are the why did my predecessor had to leave without saying goodbye to his staff he was bodily taken in the night in a highest man to aludama junction and then his car came and he went home he was scared so i want to know why i don't want that to happen to me so sometimes you get advice from people who have gone before you self improvement is very important when you all the things you have studied in marketing apply that to your career do a 10 year plan you know in end of this master program 10 year plan of course uncertainty things are there the bad economy in sri lanka and the power cuts and the the, the pandemic situation and then this terrible war in in europe all that has an impact on the, that macro level environment impact what we are doing so that you and i can't change things but we can change things in the mesto or the middle part or the micro the, the hotel the departments we can sort of control those areas self improvement is important i i studied i didn't speak english when i was 17 years old right and i'm not shy to say that i studied at anand college and we never spoke english there and when i joined the hotel industry i was very nervous because you were studying in english at the hotel school and i i didn't think that i can do that so my boss in the earlier hotel said you have to improve your communication and i took it very seriously uh, and then i of course the article says what i did about it and in the, in the long run he said you are shy you know your pr is not good uh, learn some marketing and of course i took that very seriously sometimes when you have a mentor who really means well for you you should take that i advice uh, very uh, be focus on that advice now orientation i what i talk about this case study is there was no orientation the previous manager had already gone my the director who came from workers to his head office spent 10 minutes there showing me the place showed me the apartment and then showed me the office introduced five managers said this is your secretary boom he went back to colombo so that is a very bad orientation right uh, so sometimes you have to make your own orientation you know it is important uh, sometimes uh the companies don't do the best orientation and then uh, you know you have to plan it yourself i'll give two examples in my life when i went to jamaica that was a long period i had three weeks there during my orientation period uh, when i took over the hotel because the previous guy he is a swedish uh, hotelier he and i overlap for three weeks so i had three weeks and that's too long for orientation you know what i did there was a huge sales team there in the, in the hotel in the best five star hotel in the, in the capital uh, there were about i think 12 or 15 people in the sales team i said okay you know what i'm going to do i'm going to spend 3 hours every day during this uh, 15 days monday to friday doing sales with each sales manager i told you take me to your three main clients in kingston jamaica i want to understand if you can think about it i'm spending 15 days making three sales calls a day 45 sales calls and i told the sales team i want to meet who so of jamaica so i have a formally introduced introduction meeting with 45 people who fill our hotel and that was a blessing because i planned my own orientation i can also now see how good they are in selling are they sort of are they talking like parrots from uh, like uh, selling i mean uh, mcdonalds or something or are they adjusting the communication meta message to suit the personality and the style of the client so it was a very useful uh, orientation and i arranged it myself and i remember when i started teaching at nagara college i was a professor there from 2005 and i come from the university system so i want to make sure in the college system it's like the hotel school in sri lanka it's a college Uh, but they they do degrees, but they they don't do research and master's degrees and all that. I want to understand what I'm going to do because I don't want my lectures to be too high or too low. You know what I did? And I started, I think, in April two thousand four, two thousand yeah two thousand four. Uh, I asked my dean, "Is there orientation for a new professor?" He said, "Oh, it happens in the." end of the academic year you know during august we do that but you have come here in april uh, no no orientation till august so i said i have some free time 
You know what I did? I knocked at each door of the professors in that department and I told them, can I come to your class? Can I observe? They said, sure. And I went to 11 different classes. And that was my orientation. I can see the way they ask questions, students' re interaction. So sometimes you have to hold the bull by horns and do it yourself. So that the managing orientation was a key thing. Understand the, understand the ABC is very important, attitudes, beliefs, customs, and all that. And another one you should learn from that case study is you can't do everything. There are so many things to do when you take over a new hotel and you are the new manager or general manager. You have to focus on two things. Prioritize, you know, spend some time planning. What is the thing I'm going to handle first? Sometimes you deal, it's a 2080 concept. You, you handle with a problem uh, which is about 20% of the problems, but that has an impact. 80% of your operation is impacted by that little problem. Solomon was that my problem. I had to meet him and deal with it, show him that I'm not scared, but at the same time, show him some respect. So sometimes each hotel has their own priority. You have to prioritize, deal with the key challenge, and then you know gradually start. Uh, I'm going to have a spell. My fifth uh, webinar will be on personality analysis. analysis how to understand people very quickly. We don't have all day. I had to look at Solomon for two minutes and I read him. I said, this is where he's coming from. And then I, uh, you have to ask the correct question to get him to talk. And then he got emotional, you know, and then I was like a psychologist, you know, dealing with him. And, uh, uh, and then I understood where he's coming from. So to do that, you have to develop certain skills to read people very quickly. And now we will have a separate webinar on that on the fifth one. And of course, at the end, the negotiate, you have to negotiate, you give a little bit, take a little bit, all that. The second case study in Jamaica, I mean, this is the, I mentioned is the main five-star hotel in the country, 360 rooms. And uh, what you should focus on the case study is, the top level PI is very important. My top level PI was with the prime minister's office of Jamaica, with the chief of protocol in the foreign ministry. Those are the people that matter. So they will tell me things, and the British High Commissioner and the US Ambassador, you know, those are the important when you run a five star hotel. The protocol is important. You have to understand, you know, the President is coming, Castro is coming, or uh, maybe Mr. Putin. Uh, what are the things you can do? The, the raising of the flag, which flag goes higher? All those little things are very important. You can learn it from there's a department of protocol. I mean, we, Dr. Vipula will know he was a diplomat. And need to know is very important. If Mr. Putin is coming, and one of the uh, people say the richest man in the world now, the, all the money has made. And also in the last one week, he has become the most unpopular man in the world. So if he's coming to Colombo, I was disappointed none of you mentioned specifically, you also all talked about Jamaican case study. I want you to apply there today. What's happening? If, if Putin is coming today, there's a major crisis because there will be people protesting, uh, you know, people, uh, he has put more enemies than anyone else. So security, some of you said security is the most important thing. So you can't sort of read the same case study. You have to take things, make it current. It's happening in the 2022 March. And the most unpopular politician in the world is coming to Colombo. So that makes a very dynamic uh, situation. So security negotiations uh, with the dealing with the Cuban uh, high uh, ambassador, I had to negotiate. You know, they try to bully you, and you know, so that is important. At the same time, I mentioned in the case study, half of them, my guests, are from USA, and they simply hate President Castro. Uh, and uh, we had about 35% British. So I had to cons be concerned when I, uh, the hotel had three big elevators going up to the 17th floor, and I, I am now asked to block one lift as we say in Sri Lanka, lift for especially for him. So I had to now see, will it affect my other other guests? So I had to balance it sometimes, right? The flexibility, the welcome has to be a thing. And end of the day, I wanted, need to know is very important. I didn't tell any of my managers who's coming till that morning. Only one, my director of marketing knew that. Sometimes certain things you don't share with everybody, although you have a team, this particular case is uh, important because there were 127 attempts on his life before that, choreographed by CIA. So we didn't want that 
something like that to happen here. That's why they took the three floors and because then I learned that you can put a bomb in the 15th floor, be uh, under his uh, suite and then she'll get him, you know, things like that. So those the things become very exciting when you manage a five-star uh, hotel. But I didn't want any of my team, their personal opinions, the political um, uh, philosophies and not liking communism and all that, to have an impact on our service. We are professional hospitality people. We have to deliver the best service, irrespective of whether I like Putin or I like Castro or not. And of course, the memories I mentioned them there. So now, a couple of things I want to mention uh, when you are, uh, when you are uh, managing uh, uh, hotels. It's all about how you do it. This, uh, this old side I did, you, when you are the hotel general manager, you are sandwiched between or you are working with three types of customers. You have the paying customer, right? The, the guests or people who are coming to the restaurants and bars, nightclub, all that. Then, of course, your company. I always treated my board as my customer. I am treating them. I'm making sure they're happy. I'm making sure they get the ROI. Return on investment. That's important. They have invested money, right? In this case, in this case, it was 60% owned by the government of Jamaica. So I considered government as my employer, although I was employed by the British company, 14 uh, in London. Uh, then, of course, the employee. Most hoteliers get the owner part and the customer part. They don't pay enough attention to the employee, treating the employee as the internal customer. One company who has done it very well. Is Marriott. I mean, they, they, if you go to any Marriott, they say they say we are, you are, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. You are nothing below or inferior. And if you go to a Ritz Carlton, uh, which is owned by actually by Marriott, Ritz Carlton, any Ritz Carlton hotel, the main cafeteria has the same menu like the coffee shop of the hotel for the guests. Same menu. There are no difference. So that is to instill that philosophy, internal customer. So now you have these three, it's a triangle, three types of customers. You are in the middle as a hotel manager. How do you be successful? In my view, you need four things, four types of skills, knowledge, and you have to align the needs with your knowledge. To know, managers come from an operational background. They are either come from food and beverage, rooms division. And then of course, a very important other aspect is marketing. Okay, you didn't like what I said? Okay, anyway. Uh, so the financial aspect is very important. And then end of the day, human resources. So if you want to be a hotel general, and most of you don't want to be, you want to be academics and you want to be in the travel. You are going to be a hotelier particularly because it's different from anything else you do. It's not people put us in the same back of the banking sector as it you. My bank, I meet a young guy who's my financial advisor. I spend uh, 10 minutes with him. But the hotel guests stay with you for a week or two or one day. And you know, so when your customer live under the same roof with you, it becomes very complex. So you have to surround yourself with these four areas of knowledge, operations, marketing, finance, human resources. You may have a lot of questions. We'll do that at the end because I had to cover all these slides. Now, in my view, there are four types of hospitality managers. If you want to become a professional hotelier or hospitality manager, there are four levels. I categorize them uh, into four. In my career, I mean, if you read my uh, column, which comes on the island newspaper, I'm still talking about my first, first eight or seven or eight years of my career. And I've worked I was a local hotelier. I worked at the 
went to, went to the beach, went to Coral, I was transferred to Coral Gardens, then came to Sea Sands, then came to Swanee, Beruan, all within 23 miles, right? And then I also later managed uh, a small hotel in Ambalangwada, and I also started a small lodge in the Mathur. But all those six jobs, over six years, uh, some of them I did uh, you know, concurrently, uh, I was a local hotelier. I was in the south coast, southwest coast, and similar market, similar guests were coming from Nekaman, Sherburg, uh, Hotel Plan, Kuni. So I was a local hotelier. But then I said, no, I should go to the next level. So I was transferred to the head office in John Keyes. I became manager operations for seven hotels, and then I worked in uh, Abarana. Now I'm a still a Sri Lankan hotelier, but I'm working in my country, which is, you know, I'm, but I am not scared to go to, uh, just because I am from a particular area, say Bentota, I want to say I, my whole career I'll be in Bentota. That's the most comfortable thing to do. But national hoteliers are people who take a chance. They go to Kandy and then uh, someone say, would you like to manage the Jet Ping Hotel in Jaffna? I said, yeah, sure, I like to learn that. You are a national hotelier, you are in your own country, you go to different areas. Then comes, in my career, I then suddenly left a very good job in Colombo just to become an expatriate hotelier in the Middle East. I took a contract and went to Middle East. Some people go to Maldives, Islands, right? No, that is, you are becoming a regional hotelier. You are becoming a little bit more adventurous. You take more chances. Level list like what I did in my career in the last uh, 30 years and become you become an international hotel to you of course you know not that everybody wants to do that you know you lose your sort of cultural heritage and you go from one place to another i call myself a global gypsy so it is nice you get to see the world i have now traveled to nearly 100 countries it's nice and you are you are paid far more about you know six times the salary of a local hotelier it's good adventurous but it's not meant for everybody. You are away from your family, so there are two sides of the coin. So there are four categories of hospitality managers in the world. We discussed this before. If you want to be an international hotelier, what happened is that the AB, same ABC, attitudes, aspirations, beliefs, and behavior, customs, and culture, becomes most challenging. Now, when I took over the main hotel in Jamaica, with that came 400 Jamaicans. I had to very quickly understand how the, what is the Jamaican mindset? What motivates them? And I'm in Kingston. Kingston also has the highest murder rate in, in the world, second highest murder rate. So I don't understand that, you know, security, all those things, where they come from, you know, very quick, like dealing with Solomon, but now at an international different level. So it is tough sometimes when you try to do, move from country to country. Okay, study today is about Guyana. I want to uh, mention something about Guyana. I was interviewed uh, for a job with the Forte, uh, Trust House Forte, the hotel company. I was just leaving Mount Lavinia Hotel in 93. I applied to all the hotel chains and then I was called for an interview in London. So I went there and they said, okay, we feel that you will be good as an internationally mobile manager. That means you will go to any country, you are given two days notice, you pack your bags, you move. So they say, we are going to send you to Guyana. Have you been to South America? I said, no. Have you been to the Caribbean? No. <laughs> I knew, I did not do much about Guyana. The things I knew about Guyana were, I knew that it's the only English speaking country in South America. I knew that it is part of the Amazon rainforest. 90% of the country is covered with the rainforest. I knew they play cricket, and I was a fan of uh, Clive Lloyd, uh, whom I consider the greatest captain ever lived uh, in the cricket world. He was knighted uh, just two, two months ago. He's now Sir Clive Lloyd. I knew about him. I knew about a guy called Sir Sridhar uh, Ramphal at that time. I used to follow politics. He was, the, uh, he was Guyanese. He became the Secretary General of Commonwealth. And later we became friends. He became uh, the, uh, chancellor of the university I worked in, uh, Jamaica, the University of West Indies. Then I knew one more thing. I knew about Jonestown. I don't know whether you guys knew Jonestown. It happened before some of you were born. In 1978, 
I read the Times and Newsweek, I was amazed that this could happen in the world. Because of a preacher, uh, he had his whole, uh, all the followers, nearly 1,000 people were living in a, they were given a, a section in Diana. They lived there. It was called Jonestown. His name was Jim Jones, very charismatic priest, uh, Christian priest, but he had a twist in his mind. But he took all these people to Guyana to live with, with him. And one day he felt that his, his village will be attacked by the uh, CIA and the American uh, uh, politicians. He decided to kill himself and kill all his followers. So the actual, actual number was 909 people, including 276 children. The mothers were asked to give poison to their children, and then the mothers and the fathers took the poison. They all killed themselves, including Jim Jones. This is the one of the. This is the biggest mass suicide uh, suicide in the world history. And I want to go to Jonestown, and I knew about it. So when I landed in Guyana, I said, "Can you take me to Jonestown one day?" They looked at me because it's dark tourism, right? I mean, I mean, as interested. I want to know how did he motivate 909 people to give their life? But it doesn't appeal to everybody. Yeah, they were very shy about it. They said, oh, no, no, we can't go. It is all mines and things like that. But now today, after 25 years later, they are now looking at opening that up and making it a tourist attraction. So tourism has different dimensions and all that. So anyway, this is Guyana. This is Kaitua Falls, which is five and a half times taller than Niagara Falls, which is in my basically in my backyard. This is five and a half times taller, and no one knows about it. It's in the, in the Amazon uh, forest. Uh, I also knew when I landed in Guyana that the first general manager of uh, the hotel I manage is called Guyana Pegasus. Uh, it's a British, it's a 40, 40 hotel. The first general manager, before me, all the GMs were uh, Europeans uh, for 25 years. First general manager, want to see Kaitu Falls, he went in a plane, eight-seater plane to see Kaitua Falls. They never saw him again because the plane had only a single engine. They don't know what happened. The pilot, him and his uh, assistant, they were never found after that. So I was, I'm, I'm going to Kaitu Falls and I, in eight-seater thing, and I asked the pilot, what happened to that first general manager? He said, oh, uh, the plane would have met with the accident. And you know, then I said, uh, so I understand they had uh, only one single engine. And then he, the pilot didn't talk. I said, how many engines do you have? He said, one. <laughs> that means if one engine uh, breaks, you're finished. You're in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Anyway, that was a scary story. Okay. So something about Guyana, because most of you, I don't think you know about Guyana. It's a very diverse country. They were like us, Sri Lanka. They have a Dutch and the British. We, then you have Portuguese. Uh, they got independence uh, in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 1966, but they did not have free elections till 1992. Small population, three quarter million. This, this is the size of United Kingdom. So it's a relatively big country. Uh, and uh, so United Kingdom is about what? It's about four times the size of Sri Lanka, right? So that's the size of Guyana. Uh, mixed population, main uh, segment of population are Indian. And then, of course, the Africans who came as uh, great, great grandfathers came as slaves. Indians who came as laborers. I'm an Indian 10%. They are the other people who own, they are the original people. There are a lot of mixed people, Portuguese and Dutch and all that. Region wise, also very uh, diverse. So it's quite an interesting country. Now, one thing I want to mention is a very poor country. My first impression when I went to Guyana in 94, I looked at it and I still remember sending a postcard to my son. And I told him, this country is about 25 years behind Sri Lanka. Impression. It's behind, you know, they have a lot of vegetation and all this. They have gold, diamonds, all that, but be owing to the corrupt politicians and all that, I mean, that is something you guys know, uh, they were backward country. So it was about 25 years behind Sri Lanka at that time. But I quickly, because of my concept of ABC, I quickly settled in the hotel. That's the main hotel. It was the largest hotel in Guyana. Uh, I had to manage two hotels. I also managed a co-resort in the Amazon rainforest. 
And it's not one of these plastic eco resorts, it's a real thing. There are no electricity, no hot water. It's in the middle of the forest. It took four hours for us to take the customers there in jeeps and boats, and it was a real thing. I went there every weekend. So I was officially, the red ones were my official titles. I was general manager for the main hotel in the city, and I was general manager for the number one eco resort in, in the country. Because of my passion about various other things and various talents, I started starting new businesses. And there, I mean, I, I was given a free hand and because of the location. Uh, I mean, none of my directors came there. They came like once in six months from London. So I had a total free hand. Um, I set up their first hotel school there and I was the principal of that. I, I set up the program. I trained all my managers. I trained our competition. Uh, we have so much of land. Uh, I started a horse riding school with the police department. Uh, I was also became a visiting professor of the university. I used to teach tourism marketing. I converted part of my lobby to an art gallery and helped the local artists to uh, basically exhibit their stuff virtually free. And I used to produce things for a stage. So I took all the talents and produced a huge show with the aim of raising a million dollars for Guyana Relief Council. We didn't achieve that target, but I think we raised about 800,000 uh, million in their currency. Uh, because of my passion and my back, the series of uh, uh, food festivals, the main one was the Sri Lankan Food Festival. I invited a couple of locals in, uh, in the country and with them we set up and then uh, we put Sri Lankan flag there and the festival was very popular. Uh, after doing all that, uh, after a year, they also chose me as the hotel of the year. Not a big deal, Diana doesn't have many hotels, but I was honored that the locals would give me that honor. So this is what I did in 94-95. I show you some pictures. The hotel uh, is not very big, but it's the largest hotel. It's just only eight floors. When I said it's backward, 25 years behind Sri Lanka, School children will write to me, school principals, and take permission to bring busloads of students to come to the hotel, go to the rooftop, eight floors. This was the tallest building in Guyana at that time. Uh, so it is a very simplistic country, and I love Guyana. I consider that for third home, actually. Uh, and people are very simple. This is the president, uh, Dr. Jagan and Dr. Sam Hines. They were my friends, right? And actually, Dr. Jagan treated me like his own son. He was very fond of me. This is in the middle of uh, the, uh, the, the, the big show I organized. And then, uh, you know, one thing I want to tell you. Now, it's like in Sri Lanka, similar culture, you know, because, uh, you know, Indian, 40% Indian. They all ask for free things. I said, no, no, no. The show, all the ministers call me Mr. Chandi. They can't pronounce my full name. So they used to call me Chandi. Mr. Chandi, can I have four tickets, free tickets for the show? I said, no, no, it's a charity show. You have to buy the ticket. So what I did was I went to see Mr. Dr. Jagan, told him, Your Excellency, I came here to uh, sell you tickets. He said, oh, I have to buy the tickets? He had never purchased tickets. I said, yes, because we are racing, trying to raise $1 million. And he bought two tickets for him and his uh, the first lady. After that, all the politicians calling me, I told them, oh, no free tickets. Dr. Jagan just bought two tickets. And after that, no one asked me for anything free. So sometimes you have to, you know, be a bit tactful, but also put your foot down. This is the eco resort I manage. The gentleman in the blue shirt, his name is Sir Rocco Forte. He's knighted by the Queen of England. Uh, he was my chairman. He, he at, at one time, this company who owned this resort and the Guyana Pegasus were the number one hotel company in the world. There are 1,000 hotels in 40 countries. So this is the chairman when he came to visit the place. This is the hotel school, the first batch who graduated. Uh, most of them are my managers. We also trained other managers. There are no hotel school before. They had like a home science school. And, uh, and I felt that as a hotelier in the main hotel, that was my job to get the support of the local customers, the locals. You have to do some meaningful things. I want to key, uh, leave a legacy that, you know, set up the first hotel school and the uh, education program in the university. So uh, I think 
when you become international, you have to think of those other projects that you do. You give your time and whatever skills you have. Uh, this is the prime minister's uh, office and some people who came from head office. And uh, I was going to hand over the check uh, from the show. Uh, we didn't make 1 million. It, I think it was about 800,000. And it, we made a tea party and, you know, Everything is about PR, especially when you're international, everything is PR. You know, you make a good impact in the minds of your host country and you are very respectful about the culture. You may not agree with everything you hear, but you never talk religions, you never talk politics. International hospitality is a different ball game uh, compared to being a national hotel. Uh, this is a Sri Lankan food festival that we did. Uh, I surrounded myself with some Sri Lankan families. It was very popular. And the joke here is this guy here, uh, he was my executive chef. So I dressed him in a full suit and I said, this week we have shopped the jobs. Uh, my chef will become the general manager and I will manage the kitchen and I'll cook for you. And they were, the journalists like that. So sometimes you have to do your PR with the local journalists and you know, uh, and in Diana, everybody knew, not to brag, but everybody knew us. I went to buy some fish. Fishermen knew, hey, Mr. Tandy, how are you? Because they have seen the TV footage of all our food festivals and shows and everything. PI is the key. If you ask me two things that matters, if you want to have an international career, they both start with uh, P. You, you, the personality analysis, which I'm going to teach you on the last uh, thing, that is very important. Very quickly, you have to understand the ABC of people that you're dealing with. Other one is PR, you have to do PR at different, different levels. This is the opening of the art gallery. Basically, I converted the, the main, this hotel lobby is the most fashionable place uh, to hang out and have tea and you know things like that. Uh, I converted part of that to a uh, art gallery to help the local artists. This uh, lady, she's an American lady. She's the first lady, uh, president's wife, opening of the art gallery. Then uh, these are some students from University of Guyana. I also became a student there. I went to art classes. So this, uh, the, what you see in the background, I painted that. It's a mural for the outgoing vice chancellor. So your PR should not stop at different levels. You can be an excellent PR person with the student body, artists of the country, travel agents, people who are dealing with the boats going to the Amazon rivers, president, everybody. You do PR with different people at different levels. This is uh, Clive Lloyd, uh, whom I consider the greatest cricket captain. Under his captaincy, I think over 15 years, West Indies became the unbeaten team that no uh, no team uh, England or Australia could beat at that time. They are different now. Now, Georgetown itself is a, is a poor city. The most fascinating thing for me is this one is called Seawall. They have a seawall because it's a city built by the Dutch below the sea level. So you need the sea wall to protect when the high tide is there, we don't want the water to come to the city. So very poor sort of underdeveloped, but there are some historic areas. Now, what happened was 2007, I, I was there for only for one and a half years, but I was very popular and, uh, and I had so many friends there. And now I'm in, the, the, in Canada, working as a professor at Niagara College. I get a call, 2000, seven. The guy who called me is my friend, Mani Ram Prashad. He was the uh, he was the director, government representative in my board of the hotel. So we were quite close and you know, he, he, he liked me and then we were like buddies. Now he's a political animal. He has now become the minister of tourism. I did not know that. He said, hey, my brother, he called me brother. Brother, I'm Mani Ram here. Now I'm minister of tourism. Uh, President asked me to call you. So I want to show you the power of PR. Now, this is 12 years after I left Guyana. I never been there. 12 years later, President, now there's a new younger president. Uh, the My friend, Dr. Uh, Chedi Jagan uh, passed away. So there's a new, new president. Minister of Tourism tell me, Chandi, I was asked to contact you by the president. So I said, what president? Which company? He said, no, no, president of the country. I'm just coming from a cabinet meeting. We have a problem, my brother. I, we want your help. I said, well, I'm here. I'm working. 
do you want from me? He said, you know, we are having two events in Guyana for the first time. We are getting some matches of the World Cup cricket 2007. And we are also going to be the host country for Rio Summit. Uh, so Rio Summit is actually uh, the 12 or 13 countries in South America. Plus there are about six countries in the Caribbean who speak Spanish, including Cuba. All of those presidents, 19 presidents were coming to Guyana for this summit, which happens every four years. So I said, okay, but that's fine. But what do you want from me? He said, oh, we are building a new convention center, new stadium, and a new five-star hotel. Uh, so I said, that's good. What do you want from me? He said, we are having problems. We got some business people to invest money in the hotel and uh, the stadium and the, uh, and the conference center, but we are having some problems with the catering. The hotel is not ready. It is being delayed. And we are really worried the cabinet of the country feels that we may not be ready when the cricketers come and the, when the presidents come for the Rio summit. We want you to come and help us to open these three properties. I said, really? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I can get leave from here anyway. So that uh, eventually we agreed that I'll come for a short period. Uh, so I was general manager of this hotel, consultant general manager. Uh, I was asked to open the hotel. I also helped them with the stadium and, and the convention center, but my main job was to be the general manager of their brand new hotel. So this new hotel is the biggest hotel. It was called Buddy's International Hotel. I think they had about 250 or 300 rooms. It was the biggest hotel in the country. I was asked to open it. So I said, okay. I felt like a mercenary going to Amazon uh, for us uh, with this task. And of course, I negotiated. I, I want to bring uh, another person with me. Uh, and then they, I mean, we were paid some big bucks also. Uh, I took a food and beverage. One of my former assistant food and beverage managers, his name is Lali Silva. I knew him for a long time. I said, Lalit, come with me. Uh, so we did this project for my company, Chandi J Associates, and uh, Lalit Silva became an associate. So the hotel wasn't a very well planned hotel at that time. It looked like this. Uh, it was built by locally developed. I asked, the first question I asked uh, Mariram, the Minister of Tourism, why the hell didn't you get a franchise? Why didn't you work with Hilton, Marriott? They were given the hotel design and everything. Why build yourself. Anyway, that's what they did. My job was to open it. So I'll show some pictures. So this is February. I had three days. So I met the owner of the, the hotel. He said, you know, Chandi, the biggest challenge is we are going to have the soft opening. Uh, so I said, okay, okay, Mr. Uh, I think his name was Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh, I will do what I can do. So I said, do you have any supervisor? So I had a... Ready, staff were not trained, supervisor, there are no organizers in charge. I had to do all that Call them. We have a team of four. I'm the GM. Lali Silva is my food and beverage manager. All consultants. <coughs> Paul Mini, I got him as the uh, financial control and the room division manager. And Garmin Himalayan as the executive chef. Plus the locals and other people who were there. Then I had one staff meeting. I knew that I had to motivate them. They had no, uh, what do you call no feeling that this will happen. They didn't know how the hotel will open, uh, how to do it. 
I had to immediately focus on those four consultants to do training, but I said, don't teach them unnecessary things, Lali. Teach them how to carry a tray. That's what they know. They didn't know how. And then, of course, they, through the training program, we picked the best waiters, etc., to serve the uh, the presidents, etc. So dealing with diversity. So of course, there were some Guyanese, some Chinese. Uh, there was a Chinese restaurant in the hotel, some Indian restaurant, some Nepalese, Canadian. I focus on the six M's. You know, six M's, right? That's what managers manage, right? Six M's. So one is men. I mean, though it's written those days by a man. I'm sure men means men and women. Uh, you manage money. You manage machinery. You, you manage uh, all right, and machinery. So those are the six steps you manage. I quickly paid a lot of attention to do action lists. Every day, every morning, my four Canadian experts and the local managers, Chinese, they came. I Everybody had an action list. So I gave them a full list of things they had to do in the three days, and we ticked the things they, they completed. And of course, all the tasks we had to do, I said earlier, like uh, Swani, prioritize. Solomon was my key problem. So that is a must-do thing. Here, must-do things are for the soft opening. 600 people are coming. Should-do things are things that we can do after we do the soft opening. We had another one week uh, for the heads of state to come there. And then, of course, the World Cup was happening in another month's back. I said, yeah, let's focus on the World Cup later. Uh, Sri Lankan team, all of them stayed at this hotel. I had to focus also basics. We had no power, no water, no telephone, no internet. And we are going to open this place in uh, three days' time. So it was like a walking on the uh, water type of miracle. Uh, then, of course, I had to... Uh, they had in LA, the consultants stayed in another this hotel rooms are not ready. And I quickly learned that the owner also has the number one nightclub in uh, Georgetown, in the capital city of Guyana. He has a couple of restaurants. He was in catering business. So I said, perfect. Get me all the menus from your chain restaurants. And I planned the menu looking at the a la carte menus of, he had five or six restaurants. Those restaurants, we picked easy to prepare, easy to, some came from other restaurants, so we sort of outsourced the food because our kitchen, gas, everything was not connected yet. And of course, we ran our own bars. Bars are easy to operate compared to the kitchens, and we need some quick training, uh, and of course, the security is important, uh, and of course, we had to, they wanted fireworks at the opening and all those things, and I focus as a general manager, focus on looking after the VIPs, the president who's coming to open the hotel, and the media. Media. PR with media is very important. They can make or break your reputation. You have to deal with them, you know, do little PR with the media. So on the day one, now are three days to open the hotel. It looked like this. It's a construction site, right? Nothing, and uh, I'm not wearing suits and all that. I'm in my Niagara College t-shirt. I'm in the battlefront. And then they were claiming this, actually it's true, this pool is the largest pool in Guyana. So that is one of the key USPs, unique selling propositions, but there's no water yet, right? And then the day two, I had a meeting with the staff. Most of them, would, they have 300 employees. They come, whole day they will sit around in the shade, they, you know, with the umbrellas, and they, they bring the lunch packet, eat it, and then they sit there for eight hours, go home. They were not doing any work at all. So we, I had a meeting with them. I had to instill motivation, get them, you know, build the confidence. We can do this. We'll train you. I have these consultants coming. So it was a very interesting case study. Uh, but I had to understand the diversity. The fact that I lived in this country for one and a half years and I was popular hotel here was the plus point. That's why I got hired for the job. I understood the diversity of the country. And of course, these are the, my ad hoc management team, the supervisors who might give them ranks and, you know, just for the opening. And then I had to tell them, yes, we, we can do that. And they, they were not sure. So sometimes when you're the leader in a difficult assignment like this, you bring the mission and you train your supervisors with the mission. They are the ones who are going to implement. And then you instill the passion with these, all these people. I'm meeting them for the first time, but I had to get them on my side and work hard and you know, so that's what I did. 
Dear three, we were ready. We have got a uh, few things, and this is the pool area ready for the 600 people. Of course, you know, front didn't look very fashionable. Even the lettering of the hotel wasn't done well. But, you know, sometimes when you do a project, you can't sweat the small stuff. Focus on the key elements. Getting the hotel ready in three days. That was my, uh, for the, we are camouflaging, you know, having the opening to show people that we are there. Of course, then it was open, but we still didn't have power. I still remember the day we opened the hotel, we didn't have power and water. We were running generators, but opened it. President came, and this is a young president. He was having a chat with me, and then he looked very worried because the heads of his host, all these heads of state. I said, you know, don't worry, Your Excellency, I will do my best. Next morning, I was so tired. I was in this rest house or guest house with my Canadian buddies. I got up in the morning, I was, I was so tired, I worked 20 hours the previous day. I put the TV on, Guyanese TV. And they are praising, all the journalists are telling, this is the best event ever held in our country. And they, I said, what are they talking about? They were talking about yesterday's event. What we did without water, elect electricity, all that, TV. We got so much publicity uh, because we, we were practical. We got our outsourced food. We never told anyone that, but you know, because the owner had the, all the restaurants, somehow we had the soft opening. It was a huge success. Now I have something to brag about with my, with the staff, because we did it. So I went to him and say, "Remember, uh, you don't have to worry about this. this. I made it a case study for my graduate students, so we'll skip this one." Uh, these are the things I did for the next five days to get the hotel open. Now that hotel had a soft opening, but you have to do the real thing. And I always, I thank everybody, but ask three questions. Where are we today based on the action plan? Where do we want to go? We want to have 19 presidents staying in this hotel in one week's time. How, do, how to get there is the third question. So we do the action plans and all that. And the first guest, we, we checked in, the, uh, the four Canadians came there, stayed there. One thing I did well, I think, I didn't keep any special task for me. Everybody else were busy because when you're opening a hotel, you have to have some breathing space because you are in a foreign land, opening a hotel and going to host 19 prisoners. At the end, you had to be very practical. I... Uh, in fact, I still remember telling the president of the country, I don't think it's a good idea to put all the 19 presidents here. Let's put the most important presidents here. I will do deals with the other hotels, but I managed before Pegasus and all that, and do deals with them and some of the prime ministers and people like that will, will share the wealth. So that's what we did. I hosted only six out of 18 presidents who came. But we opened the hotel. We, we did a lot of work, protocol, planning. Uh, and then these are some of the pictures taken after the opening. This is Garmin Himalal, my executive chef. This is uh, the Canadian, Dr. Paul Willey, who was setting up the uh, uh, front of his systems. You know, opening a hotel for Hilton and Marriott is easy. Because you get 13 manuals, it says everything you have to do. Here in the middle of the forest, you have to open a hotel, no systems, you have to have it here or get people who have it here and then work with them. So it is a really, a, really a big task. If I had a, if they consulted me earlier, I would have advised them to get a franchise with even with Holiday Inn or whoever would have come with the systems and standards and everything. But anyway, this is what we had to do. And that's after we opened the hotel and this is the minister came to thank me. And of course, this is Lali Silva, my, uh, my assistant. Uh, he, he, I took him as a food and beverage manager. And I did, and they said, well, Chandi, you have done such a good job. Why don't you continue as a GM? I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I have a contract in Canada. But Lalit, why don't you promote him? So I actually introduced Lalit as the general manager. Uh, and of course, we did a few other things uh, for the next month after the president stayed there. We had to get ready for the World Cup. All the teams, uh, Sri Lanka, the, the West Indies team, the Australian team, they were staying. So we've, we've, 
when you have a short term plan you do some ad hoc things and then you formalize it so then i said i had a little breathing space we organized organization structure i did a detailed report to the owner debrief the client i said you know you have to have some other professionals take lalita as a general manager but you need a good financial controller and executive chef once the canadians go back and you know also i introduced consultant chefs i even try to work on a franchise and i wanted them to be successful i want to show you a couple of slides today it is one of the top 3 hotels in guyana uh, it is now a ramada uh, princess hotel today they also have the best banquet hall one of the best banquet halls in guyana so they learn from the opening but they have progress and i am very proud of that i am proud to say that i opened that hotel i gave the start and then they have taken it to the next level today they also have one of the largest food and beverage operations in guyana and the national stadium is doing running very well and also the convention center now i want to jump from 2007 to 2019 things that country my second or third home so actually is my fourth home after sri lanka is england canada jamaica then gone uh they done so well <coughs> partly because they also found oil in guyana a few years ago so these are some of the achievements for a country view who my consider 25 years behind sri lanka in 94 when i sent the postcard to my 8 year old son had done so well i'm so proud of them now 2019 just before pandemic these are some of the things they achieved they became number one in the world number one best of eco tourism in itb berlin itb is the largest travel fair in the world they got the first prize CTO CTO is the Caribbean Tourism Organization they are the main body government public sector body for 33 countries although Guyana is not Caribbean they consider it is a member of that body it became the best destination stewardship award uh, it's a sustainable tourism award they won they won the second prize silver prize they nothing i did this is my team the, the my former colleagues who did all this silver prize in best adventure Uh, uh destination at the world travel mart in london which is the second largest travel fair uh, itb berlin they also became one of the top 10 sustainable destinations in the world and motivated with that i want to help this destination i uh, co i planned this and co-authored co-edited their first uh, publication international publication dedicated to tourism of guyana is one of those what journals um, Uh, worldwide hospitality tourism themes uh this is the book we did i actually put uh, mr donald sinclair as the first uh, editor and now the second editor uh, he was donald is the director general of tourism and a former student of mine he did this uh, doctoral part of the doctoral uh, i was a subvice so we wrote this book and you can also get it from emerald and then we took it to a next level by uh, in few years after that donald sinclair had moved to acto acto is the amazon corporate treaty organization uh, eight countries which uh, share the common wealth of amazon i organized a major conference for those eight countries looking at the sustainable practices of the whole of south america and then encouraged with that i did this presentation on tourism in the amazon uh, in cre cre you should uh, learn cre is the largest uh, conference in uh, for tourism and hospitality educators in the world normally 2000 professors come to that it's held in different parts of america sometimes it comes to canada as well so this will happen in 2010 and couple of tips if you want to have a global career it sounds nice but it's a lot of work you first do that in your country first you want to be a international hotelier first manage a hotel in your country in sri lanka you know the culture a b c c c right and don't think of a international global career if you don't like showbiz to me entertainment showbiz hospitality same you are in the public eye you are entertaining people and not suited for all, all the people 
Uh, next week, I want to, before, I mean, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, next week, we are going to talk about profitable food and beverage, not just running restaurants, but to make profits out of that. Uh, I will send you an article, a book chapter, in one of the books I, I publicly co-wrote some years back in England. It was a standard book for many universities in uh, England for a long time. Uh, I think it's out of print now, but I will share an uh, article, a uh, chapter I wrote there. Also, I'm going to send the link of Confession 39. So this is the next one. You read how the hotel manager started 25 years. This is about how we took the hotel to a next level in organizing food and beverage events. It's all fun or events. Uh, I will send you the link uh, and you can read. So those are the two uh, papers you read and come ready for the questions. I will, you'll get an email from me tomorrow. In addition, I will do a third case study. It is all finance. Uh, you don't have to be accountant to understand that, but some criteria, how to analyze the profitability, sensitivity of the profitability of departments and, and hotels. Question time, sorry, I told you it's a long uh, thing. We, uh, uh, can I ask my uh, coordinator, uh, the, Stop share. Okay. When is your next class, my friend? Uh, at 11 o'clock, doctor. 11 o'clock. What's your time now? Uh, almost 10.30. 10.30. Is it okay if we spend about 10 minutes answering questions, 10, 15 minutes more? Sure, doctor. Shouldn't be a problem. All right, guys. So any questions on, I went very fast, I apologize, but I want to cover a lot of things for you guys. Uh, ask me any questions you have on what we discuss uh, and we try to ask. Any questions? We still have 17 people, that's good. We can spend about 10 minutes answering, asking, uh, answering questions if you have any. And then after that, I hand over to uh, our friend who will uh, conclude the session as the moderator. Any questions? Anyone who would like to be an international hotelier? This is the one that you Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, that's good. I can go to bed. It's now 12 midnight here. I will hand over to anu Anushka to uh, wrap up the session. Over to you. Thank you, Doctor. I hope that through this webinar, we'll be better positioned in our business and we'll be better informed and equipped with helpful tools and guidance. More importantly, learn and emulate these good practices of business model to help them and their workers overcome the challenges, especially after uh, 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 recovering on COVID on our way to recovery of the hotel management and the other industry. Uh, talking about the interesting case studies, it's it's actually a couple of articles out of the series of articles uh, published by Dr. Chandi, leading 31 different organizations in, in his journey over 51 years in the hospitality and tourism industry. Um, most of those articles are his personal experience and professionalism that they are, he's sharing about. Dr. Chandi, may I take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude and taking us through these sessions with your expertise and covering different aspects, sacrificing your valuable time. Thank you, Dr. Vipula Vanikasekara, veteran Sri Lanka tourism, uh, and Ms. Shanti joining all the way from Australia and Caribbean, respectively, despite being a Sunday and different time zones, and others who join from outside to to uh, succeed our webinar. Thank you again, Professor Suranga Silva, for giving us this opportunity and introducing a new concept of introducing webinar, lecture, and discussion to cover the best practice model. Last but not least, uh, I thank my colleague Gayatri for facilitating the entire series and my batchmates. As Dr. Chandi mentioned, uh, next week webinar number four is all about on profitable food and beverages and management on 13th of March, Sunday. 
wishing you all a fantastic Sunday. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. I go on. Thank you. I go on. End of recording. Thank you, Ishara. Thank you. Thank you, Anushka. Thank you. You are a good thank moderator. You. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sandy. I, I know it's too late. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Actually, next uh, on the 19th, I have another webinar.